You're live. Okay, welcome back, folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee, and we're continuing our work on the House Healthcare uh, Draft 5.1 to S3. And we have with us the chair of the House Healthcare Committee, Representative Lippert, to uh, give us an update on uh, the language here, where his committee is, and also to help us understand the language a little bit more. Uh, I did go through the language as best as I could in the last uh, 45 minutes uh, on draft 5.1. So the committee has some understanding, but I think we need probably a little deeper dive a little bit in the thinking of healthcare committee. So I'll turn it over to you, Representative Lippert. And if you could just rep um, introduce yourself for the record. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Bill Lippert, uh, Chair of the House Healthcare Committee. And uh, our committee, let me start by saying that our committee has just uh, reviewed and made a few additional changes to language uh, to draft 5.1, which you have all had a copy of. And I can go over what those specific changes are. And, um, and to say that our committee voted on a vote of 9-1-1 is recommending this as our uh, amendment to the House Judiciary Committee uh, for sections five and section six. That, those are the sections of S3 that we, that we focused our attention on and that, and that was requested from the House Judiciary Committee. So we as a committee do recommend this. Um, uh, section five, should, should I just start by doing, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna read through, I mean, uh, you, you have it in front of you, you mm -hmm. can read it, but I'm gonna summarize or paraphrase and then uh, uh, be open to questions or clarifications. Does that work? That works. Uh, okay. So let's do section five first. And yes. then we'll ask okay. questions. So section five is uh, what I think, I think we all share, uh, it's an important, uh, I think is what's referred to as an inventory and evaluation of mental health services uh, provided uh, by the Department of Corrections. Um, to, to do that inventory and evaluation of services provided by the Department of Corrections. Uh, and what we, uh, what we have, what we did was expand some of the specifics of that section from what originally had been there. Um, because there was a, as you can see in uh, B1 lines, I think we have the same copy so we can refer to page and line together. Is that right? Yes, we do. Yeah, so in, uh, on page eight lines 14 through 18, uh, it's talking about a, a comparison between the services that are available in the community throughout Vermont uh, and as contrasted or compared to those available to inmates in the correctional facilities. Um, we, we've, on line 17, you, you, we've actually made a minor change, but we think it has some significance. Uh, I think that what you have in front of you Oh no, actually, I think you have this in front of you. It says currently available. Yes. And, we as, and we, we wanted to just be clear that um, currently available does not mean that, uh, it, it previously said current. Uh, we're not wanting to put a judgment on what's currently available because frankly, we think there is more that needs to be done in the community and that should, what's currently available should not be just the only baseline against which what's available to correctional inmates uh, when you're making the comparison. So what's currently available is, is the language that we're recommending there. But we also, uh, we go on and in, in number two on lines, starting on line 19 on page eight, uh, and this is where we'll, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Bill, uh, you're, you're talking about the full, the full bill or something? Because the, what we have from, for, for uh, draft 5.1 is only seven pages. So what, what are you he's talking about? on section five? Yeah. Okay. But he's talking about page eight. Oh, I'm sorry. So we we only have before us sections five, six, and seven. So we don't have the whole Okay. Page. Okay, I'm sorry. So the pages will be different. And so Representative Kim, let me say what we had we had a request, and I thought that's what had been sent to you, but if it wasn't, I apologize. 
uh, sections one through four are sections which have been revised by the House Judiciary Committee. Right. We are not reviewing them in our committee, but right. our committee members had said, would you put sections five, six, and seven in the context of the whole bill? So we, we print, we are 5.1, and I don't know why yours has, doesn't have the same, but 5.1 as it was presented to our committee had uh, sections one through four. The full bill. The full bill as as proposed by the Judiciary Committee in sections one through four. And then, so I won't refer to page, page numbers will be off then. Our, our versions are different, but yeah. we can refer to section numbers, et cetera. Okay. okay. I'm sorry, that's his phone. Okay. <laughs> sorry, Scott, I didn't realize we were. And so there'll be a little har harder because we won't have the ease of page numbers and line. And line numbers, right. Okay, thanks, Bill. Mm-hmm. So I was so okay to move on to the, so I'm in section five, there's A and B and I'm on B, no, B2. And this is where the chair of your committee, as well as our committee arrived at the fact that the language which we had in this isn't sufficient to art, really articulate what we're trying to convey. Our dis decision was, or our proposal as we approved it was uh, on the third line or fourth line of two, where it says, I'll read the whole thing, a comparison as to how the type, frequency, and timeliness of mental health services differ among Vermont correctional settings, including between men and women's facilities, which we felt like that was important. So we that's an addition our committee made. And from those mental health services provided to, and this is where I think we're both saying there needs to be a change in language. And the language that were, but I think Sarah helped us with and others in our committee raised the issue, uh, services provided to persons under the, and should be the care and custody or under the custody of the Department of Corrections or the commissioner, however you, mm -hmm. well, 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 what we said anyways, under the custody of the Department of Corrections, uh, placed, by, placed in out-of-state correctional, and I, I think you're right, there is only one out-of-state correctional facility in terms of the major contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's that's not, ours probably still says facilities, although I can, hasn't been done yet, so I can change it. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. but that, but that's, but what we were trying to get at was that, uh, because oh, excuse people- Excuse me, just, I'm sorry, just a second, but um, Al Cormier says he can join the group if you, if you want. Oh, that would be great. That might- Okay, I'll, um, Phil, Phil I guess if you- and Phil, if you could send out Al an invite. And yes, I will do so. We're talking about this right now. Yes. Okay. So, sorry, Representative Lippert, I didn't mean to. Yeah, no I problem. To... I, yep, that's fine. So I'll just pause and you can. So the goal is that it's just the out of state beds that we have a contract with Core Civic. That was, that was our intent. Okay. Uh, although the issue was raised that there may be individuals elsewhere. We were trying to compare. We, we were thinking we were trying to compare what a facility was able to provide, and if, in fact, in your committee's view, it should be something broader to include where individual offenders are. That that's that's I would say that's for your committee to determine. But yeah. we were we we were wanting to include the current Miss, Mississippi right, the current yeah. Mississippi contract, which has been in different states. Um, and I think it's important for the for those out of state beds because the contract lays out what mental health services would be provided. Mm -hmm. So we'll wait for um, Al to come on board. Anything else in section five? That's the only changes in section five, correct? That's the only change our committee is recommending to the current section five as you have it in front of you. That's correct. Okay. I might just say that, and I can wait till Al's here if you wish, whatever your preference to explain what else is in section five. Okay, so why don't we hold off here? Al is here. Uh, I know, Al, I don't know if you've seen the language. We have Representative Lippert here, who's chair of the House Healthcare Committee. Um, I don't know if you've seen the language. This is for oh, no. section, uh, this is for Senate Bill three. And it's the section five, which deals with DOC and mental health jointly doing an inventory and evaluation of the mental health services. 
And the healthcare committee is looking at this and they've got language that's saying they're, they would like a comparison done as to the type, frequency, and timeliness of mental health services that differ among Vermont correctional settings. So that's to compare between all of our facilities, including between the men and women's facilities. And, and from those mental health services provided to Vermont residents, which is an issue, we're trying to figure out the language there, in out-of-state correctional facilities. So the issue is, let's see what the mental health services are being provided to our folks who are in the Mississippi facility. Okay. So it's the language, Vermont residents is not appropriate. Should it be for persons under the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections? How do we define the folks who are the 200 folks or 180 folks who are now down in Mississippi? I, I think I think that language, just to identify myself, Al Cormier, right. Chief of Operations for the Vermont Department of Corrections. Good afternoon. Um, Vermont those, residence doesn't work. No, no. Um, and I think this is this would be specific to Mississippi. Correct. So those those individuals committed to the care and custody of the commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections housed in contracted out of state facilities. I don't know if you want to add that language in there. So I wondered about putting in that word contracted. So we have situations, Al, where we may have one of our Vermont inmates that needs a higher level of custody than we provide. And you're involved in interstate compacts as well. Right. right. So how, if we use the word contracted, would that bring those folks into the, I don't think the intent is to bring those folks because one in one of inmate, Vermont inmate, may be serving in one state, another one may be serving in another state. Right. And so those those cases in particular, those that go to another another state through the interstate compact process, they they are not required to follow Vermont's policies, practices, because we we transfer them to the custody of that state. So they fall under the rules and regulations of that state. Um, a lot of those cases are also detainees. So they may be serving federal, for example, individuals serving federal time, but they've got a Vermont detainer on them. So they're technically ours with a warrant, but they don't belong to us until they finish their federal time. Um, so they're under the federal requirements. Correct, correct. Um, so, so any of that, is any of that contracted? No. Okay, no. that's what I'm trying to figure out. No, because, you know, it's, it's part of the interstate compact, which is separate federal oversight. Um, but those individuals are required to follow the, the rules and regulations of that, that agency's department or the Bureau of Prisons, depending on what, what system they may be in. Kurt? So the only ones that are out of state and under the custody of Vermont Commissioner of Corrections are the ones in Mississippi? Correct. So we could use, so the under the custody would cover them, would be good enough. We don't have to worry about contracts or anything like that. So what you're saying, Kurt, is if we put in the words, um, persons under the care and custody of the commissioner of corrections in out of state correctional, in an out of state correctional facility, you're only talking about one facility. Right. Not facilities. Right. Then you're saying we don't have to put in the word contracted because yeah. the other folks are under the care and custody of different entities, not under the Vermont Department of Corrections. They're either under <clears throat> that particular state's custody or under the Federal Bureau of Justice. I, I, yes, but if you really wanted to keep flexibility in the future, there's the possibility that uh, a remote possibility that we would have those same 
inmates in two different facilities, so it would be plural, but that's a long shot. We're only talking between now and January of next year. Yeah, so I think facility would be fine. <laughs> I don't plan on doing any other contracts from next year. Okay. So what I'm hearing is under the care and custody of the Commissioner of Corrections, services provided to persons under the care and custody or inmates? Persons, I'd say. Persons? persons. Under the care and custody. Persons are, we've started really leaning towards incarcerated individuals, trying to get away from the term inmate. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, persons, incarcerated individuals. So persons would be okay? Yeah. Under the care and custody of the Commissioner of Corrections, in an, we got to put an AN in there, out of state correctional facility not facilities, okay. So is this a change that, um, what's her name? I'm just blanked. Katie. <laughs> Katie McLean, is that, a, is that a change that Katie would make? We are, we are going to communicate our changes to her and this, is, this was an area that we identified so we could simply make sure that our language is completely parallel. Yeah. That would... I made a note here, I think it is. Because I don't think we're going to be doing a separate amendment to House Judiciary. I think we're working off of your amendment. Okay, well, I, I, if it's agreeable, I, I will, because we just, Katie was not able to be with us this afternoon, so the final draft, and this is so, I mean, this is like, this is not a substantive change. Our committee will be perfectly fine to have your advice on how to make the language work for us Okay. and work for you. Okay, so we have another question here, Linda. Um, so I was only going to suggest that you do care, custody, or control, but that's, you know, that you included that as well, but that's your choice, um, but I suggest that. I think the normal term is care and custody of the Commissioner of Corrections. Is that Those, that's, that's what's on our minimus from the court the language that comes from when somebody's remanded to the care, it's remanded to the care and custody. I don't think we use the term control on the minimuses. So it just tracks, okay. Okay, I think that's it for that section. And then I think the rest deals more with the Department of Mental Health, correct? So anything else for Al? I think Al can go back to work. <laughs> All right, happy to well, help, thank I, you. I mean, I'll just, no. Bill? I mean, we, we hadn't had the benefit of talking with Al, but I just, so he's aware, I mean, he'll see the language, but uh, we, we are asking for uh, them to also look at, uh, are there any implications of working with a for-profit entity in terms of cost and quality of care. I mean, that won't be a surprise that those are the kinds of things which are raised on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, and um, and we also raised the question of, quite frankly, whether, and we didn't, this is not a conclusion, this is a question as to whether the Department of Mental Health should have any role in terms of oversight of uh, the mental health care of um, incarcerated individuals, as you say, uh, who are, served under your contract. But again, these are questions which we thought should be at least asked and answered. Mm -hmm. No, makes, makes sense. Because that's in, that's in the bottom, that's number four, where the working group, where the assessment of the mental health services, which is done by both DOC as well as Department of Mental Health, right. will be reporting back from January of next year. And you'd be also looking at an assessment of whether DMH should provide oversight authority for mental health services provided by the entity with whom DOC contracts for healthcare services. Okay. So that sounds all right with you, Al? It does. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, just thinking about transition and reentry, and as we talked about reentry facilities and once those individuals leave the incarcerative setting and go to the community and they are seeking mental health services, DMH is going to be responsible. So for us to collaborate on the, on the beginning before they leave, it, it, it makes sense. Okay, questions? 
from the committee? Val? Questions? Any more questions, Representative Lippert? Well, I just again, since I'm taking advantage of Al being here, uh, the last the last area that we had included was uh, just to make sure that the MOU that because there is an MOU between the Department of Corrections and uh, uh, the Department of Mental Health to uh, make sure that it adequately addresses, as we described it, the needs of individuals with severe illness or in need of inpatient care. That was the other that was the other issue that mm -hmm. we would ask that the department, the two departments, evaluate that. Mm -hmm. Adequacy. That oh, makes sense. sense. And I mean, what you know, that SFI population that we have now, we do there's certainly a lot of work going on between DMH and ourselves with, with the SFI population and placement and housing. So, yeah. Any, anything from the committee for Al on this? Does that help, Representative Lippert? Does that help, Bill? Well, it's just helpful to hear the Department of Corrections have reviewing that and saying this. This anyway. I mean, again, we're not drawing a conclusion. We're raising. We're, we're saying these questions should be evaluated. Right. Yeah, and it, it makes makes perfect sense for us. It's only. I think for us, it's only going to make our system better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you, Al. All right. Thank you. It's handy. You can just zoom in and zoom yeah, in. Yeah, that's nice, huh? I have to drive down from Waterbury. <laughs> right. All right. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything from our committee and the committee on this? Are we supportive of Section 5 as it's presented to us from Healthcare Committee? I'm seeing nods. Yes. Okay. Really good changes, I think. So let's go to Section 6. This is where the bulk of the changes are really done. Yeah. This is our working group for the forensic care. Yes. And so the charge to the working group comes after the listing of the working group. Uh, and the working group is large. But let me just say this testimony that we had from, and you've had, I know you've had testimony from uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Morning Fox as well. I I I'm sure of that. And he, in his testimony, uh, he was both asking for some additional time uh, that the, that was what was being asked in the time period was not a realistic time period. And so he also suggested the staging of uh, the work. And, and implicit in that was the idea that there might be some subgroups that it necess wouldn't necessarily all be one large working group all the time. And so uh, that's that's kind of the conceptual idea, even though it maybe isn't as explicitly stated. There was some discussion about trying to spell that out. And we said, look, the Department of Mental Health is charged with convening this. They have the ability and the authority to manage this. So we, we decided not to try to make it more specific even than it is. Uh, but on line, on section six, A, uh, the last line of A before it goes to one, it says, at, including as appropriate, with giving them the authority to say, well, this is the group that these are the members that should be part of this evaluation, and this is members. So they, they get to they get to do that from our point of view. Um, we did. So again, we've been, you know, I don't know if we were asked to do this specifically, but we had been given a draft of what the Senate or the House Judiciary Committee's redraft was. And so we incorporated a number of their suggestions into our amendment. Uh, and so we added the chief superior judge and a representative of the Vermont Medical Society, who we had heard from uh, in terms of the president, who is actually a forensic psychiatrist. So we had heard from her testimony and we incorporated those two suggestions in number three and 10. And the, other, the others are the same as what you've seen before probably. And, but we did change today. Oh, go ahead, Anne, or I mean, no, uh, we heard the same testimony as well, that okay. Chief Justice, uh, the Chief Superior Judge recommended um, to be added, as did uh, the Medical Society. So okay. that tracks. So that's, so that's consistent with what your committee is thinking and hearing. Yeah. Um, today, we did make a change uh, in the number of crime victims, representatives, and the persons with lived experience of mental illness. Uh, and we decided, after some committee discussion, uh, to actually have each of those groups have three members. 
in, in large part that was these voices can easily get lost in i mean this is a group with like judges states attorneys um directors of healthcare reform etc and so initially we were said well let's have two and two uh and then someone said well let's have i think we had a witness who said you know if you really want to have people with lived experience and I think the same could be said for victims, but testimonies from those with lived experience of mental illness, that it's intimidating, frankly, to be part of a work group where many people are holding positions of authority, et cetera. And, uh, and that was the reason to actually increase it to two. And then ultimately our committee said, no, let's say three, three and three, because these are folks who we're asking them not only to come on their own, usually on the, they'll get, they'll get, uh, you know, the compensation, but they're, they're often having to leave their lives to participate. And again, I just, I said it now, I'll say it again. Uh, these voices can easily get lost or feel intimidated in the midst of a larger group. And so our recommendation right now is three and three. What do you mean by three and three? Because I'm saying oh, I'm sorry. three um, individuals with lived experience. Are you saying now six individuals? No, no, I'm sorry. I'm saying... Well, yeah, and actually the draft does have three lived people with lived experience, but we said, it says two crime victims. So we're saying three crime victims representatives, which in this draft says two. And staying that's number, with- That's number 11 online. Yeah, yes, number 11. And yeah, uh, Representative Martel, what's, what page is that on for you? It's line four on page two. Yeah. Three. Three, thank you. I'm only used to dealing with millions. I'm not used to dealing with little numbers. <laughs> okay, so the two crime victims were increased? Yes, we were saying if they're gonna have three people with lived experience and there's, let's have three people with, uh, who are victims of, you know, how do we put it? Crime victim representatives. So you got three three crime victim representatives in, in 11, and you got three individuals with lived experience of mental illness in 14. That's correct. That's our recommendation. Okay, so we have a question here. Karen? Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Uh, curious, who is um, appointing the three folks with lived experience? I saw for the crime victims, it's Center for Crime Victim Services. I, to know if it's important to designate an uh, entity to um, mm. put those other names forward. Uh, to be honest, in our uh, deliberations, we didn't identify that. Um, what we do know is that the Department of Mental Health, and maybe it shouldn't be the Department of Mental Health appointing because they might have a, a particular point of view, right. but. Um, they also do work with uh, a number of peer, peer service groups, uh, Vermont psychiatric survivors and others. Uh, it could, it, so I, good point. We, we didn't designate. You don't have an answer. <laughs> That's right. Should, is that something, Bill, you should try to figure mm -hmm. out or do you want to leave it up to the Department of Mental Health? Uh, if it was agreeable to the committee, I might bring that back again informally to our committee to see if we could resolve that before incorporating that into our final draft. That might be helpful. I think because I think I think there's members of our committee who'd be more more um, more able to articulate that even than I am on the spot. Mm -hmm. But I, um, it could be by the Department of Mental Health in consultation with peer mm -hmm. uh, peer peer groups that yeah. they work with or something along those lines. That, that's one of the thoughts that come to my mind. For example, right now in, in, the, in the 315, the bill we just passed, or that the governor just allowed to go into law without his signature, and th this was not an area that was con controversial for him, but there is a, where there's $150,000 for doing uh, out, peer outreach to uh, um, persons who with lived experience of mental health. Uh, and, and actually a number of the community mental health centers, the designated agencies also have uh, peer, there's an increasing use of peer representatives actually in the 
outreach to others who are in crisis themselves at this point in time. It's, it's increasingly seen as an increasingly valuable service. So I think there's, there's more contact uh, with a network of what I would call peers around the issues of psychiatric hospitalization and mental health. So maybe just bring that concern back to your committee who appoints. Okay, I, I can do that. Clarify that. But thank you for pointing that out. I don't think we, we just kind of, mm -hmm. and that was not actually in the original. I mean, I think it was in the, it was actually in the original draft from the Senate, but I don't think they had, had clarified that either. So right. thank you. Um, anything else? So those are the changes that we recommend in terms of membership. Um, I'm going to highlight some of the things that are here. Uh, rather, again, not trying to read every line to you. You can, you've read it. Uh, but we incorporated from the, again, from the um, House Judiciary's draft, uh, including making sure to consider the importance of victims' rights in the forensic care process. And that's incorporated in this draft. Um, and again, when talking about, in uh, talking about competency restoration models, we, we added several things. One is that, um, and again, this is based on some of the testimony that not, some people make the assumption that competency, competency restoration can only be done through the use of medication, but there are others who believe that there may be abilities to restore competency in models that do not rely on involuntary medication. So we explicitly said that those models ought to be taken into consideration. Um, again, some of what we know from our work in the mental health field is that, um, I mean, there, there are differing opinions uh, and we in Vermont have multiple models. Uh, we actually fund several models that do not that provide care outside of an involuntary medication model. Uh, Soteria House in Burlington is a model where uh, involuntary medication is not uh, part of the care uh, or medication generally, I think, uh, and also Alyssum. Uh, but we wanted to at least make sure that the, that was taken into consideration. And I think it's later, you'll find a reference later on in the bill, which I'll point out that also touches on that. Um, again, I, I'm moving on to like E on that list. If mm -hmm. folks see where I am. Because mm -hmm. um, I think you've, you've seen the language about competency restoration models. We took out specific recommendations, references to the Connecticut program and, and we thought, Let's, let's not constrain what people can look at. And this is where, this is frankly where I think the deputy commissioner said, we, we, will, we will want to reach out to regional and national experts as an example. And we want to give them the latitude to reach out broadly and not be constrained. Mm -hmm. uh, but in E, we, again, it's, it, it may seem minor, but it's actually significant that we, it can easily fall into talking about people who have been found incompetent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity or, or right uh -huh. that that they um that particularly in incompetent to stand trial you 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 have not been adjudicated uh and so therefore you're presumed innocent so we felt like that needed to uh be made explicit because you are presumed innocent, and you, you, you're, you have the right, ultimately, if you regain competency, to have a, to have a vigorous defense. Uh, and there are instances, in fact, where uh, we know that that defense will be successful, and you will not have been adjudicated guilty of the crime at hand. Again, in line G, an F, F again, recognizes that not all incompetence to uh, to stand trial is based on mental illness. There are other instances of intellectual disability, traumatic brain injury, and dementia. And then G, um, 
again, I think we took this again from the from the House Judiciary Committee's model, where they made an explicit reference to the fact that, which we implied in a lot of our language, but we said they may be explicit. We like this. Uh, they should look at models for for forensic treatment other than inpatient facilities, including community-based treatment. And if there are models that are successful in other locations, as we're looking at how to address our needs around forensic issues, uh, we should look at community-based models, non-institutional models, as well as institutional models. So Bill, there was a question that came up on this one that why are we <clears throat> um, just looking at something other than inpatient facilities. And what was the thinking there? Because as the bill came through, it was really looking at an inpatient facility model. Well, I, I'm, 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 I think we're operating from the assumption that that will be absolutely looked at, but that we wanted to be sure that in addition, in addition to inpatient facilities. Alice, the yes. question actually was, why are we highlighting one over the other when it, they should all be addressed? All aspects of whether it's a facility, not a facility, community-based, whatever, why should one of those options be highlighted? That was the question. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, th I think that's Representative Morrissey, I believe. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I think, interestingly enough, I don't think it was our intention to exclude because I, I think we were trying to make sure that there was an inclusion of non-facility based. And if that's the language that's here, that somehow inadvertently excludes. Uh, I don't think that's what's intended, but um, again, maybe that's a place for the Uh, judiciary committee to modify our language or I could bring it back to our committee because well, again I when, again Bill I simply when I asked the question I guess I was assuming and maybe I'm wrong in assuming this is that when this group gets together they are going to uncover every angle of this discussion and it shouldn't weigh towards one or the other or if there's three or four possibilities. It should never weigh towards one. And to have the specific language for one of the possibilities in there, I think puts it out kind of in the highlights it as we're specifically looking at that instead of everyone being on the same level playing field. And yes, I don't want it to be lost in the shuffle, but I would think all of that should be looked at from all aspects but that's just my humble opinion. Well, I actually agree with you. I, I actually do agree with you. And I think, but I think, uh, and this may have been, uh, and maybe this is true for this judiciaries, because this came right out of the judiciaries amendment. I think there was, uh, I'll speak for myself. I felt like the initial version provided by the Senate went directly in the direction Went, went right to the idea of a facility and when it talks about repurposing a building and, uh, and, uh, and we were concerned that we said, we need to step back and say whether we need a forensic facility and I mean facility. And so therefore, uh, Mary, I think it was in, we picked up on the language that the House Judiciary Committee had and said, we need to make explicit that we're not talking just about a facility, but about other community-based treatment options, et cetera. Uh, maybe there's a better way to do this language so that, so that, so that it spells it out that all options are evaluated. Is that, that's what I hear you saying. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because there may be even options we, you and I haven't even thought of right. that are there, but right. I think it should be all encompassing of everything that's available, look at, and again, not saying it's a facility or community or what? Let's look at the whole picture, honest picture of what this is. So I'm just, I don't disagree with what Mary is saying. I'm just trying to, this is our preliminary report, correct? This is a preliminary report from DMH to our committees on February 1st, 
of 2022. Um, so would they at that point be able to tell, would they be able to report on models of forensic treatment within an inpatient facility at all? I'm not, I'm not negating what Mary is asking. I'm just trying to see the layout of the language. This is what would be included in the preliminary report. On or before February 1st, 2022, DMH would submit this preliminary report to our respective committees addressing any gaps in the current system, mental health system, opportunities for improving public safety and addressing needs in consideration of the victim's rights. And if that, I might comment. Yeah. Isn't the basis of this preliminary, preliminary report, isn't that going to be the basis of any other information and other things that come forward? So it's important, I would think, that this is done up front looking at all aspects. Because that's what I think you're, you're going to end up basing on. If we're kicking the can down to 2022, you know, there's the time. That's why they were lengthening the time to do this report and do it correctly. Is that that's where you're going to have the bulk of your report coming back. So if you're only kind of doing this, I guess, preliminary type of report, then what other reports after that and how many other committees and commissions are going to look at it? I'm sure it will be reviewed and continue to be reviewed, but your bulk of your information should be coming during this next period of time that the whole groups are, the groups are together. But again, my humble opinion. So I'm just trying to follow this. I should have the phone here. So I'm just trying to follow the flow here. So we have a preliminary report on February 1st, which would lay out A through H. And the question is, do we also want them to report on, on an inpatient facility? July 1st, 2022, there's another second, there's a second preliminary report that's going to be submitted to Justice Oversight Committee on whether or not a forensic treatment facility is needed in Vermont. So that's six months, five months after February 1st. So what I'm hearing is that instead of calling out just the inpatient facilities for that report in February, that, that, um, we should go in the other room, that um, we should also include a preliminary report in terms of an inpatient facility in the first report, and then follow that up five months later can I, can whether I, or not to do one? Can, can, yep. I, can I jump in here? I think, I think what I'm hearing is that uh, there's, I, I think, and I, I would want to step back and make sure I'm not misunderstanding further, but uh, that, that we, in reacting to the, the, the language that was leading, I believe, to assuming there was a need for a facility, uh, an inpatient facility that we included this language in G. But I think what, what I hear Mary saying, and I think I agree, uh, that what we're really asking them to do is in the preliminary report, look at models for forensic treatment uh, that implicitly includes a forensic facility, an inpatient facility, but also includes others. So, but the language perhaps is better, better, might better read, include models for forensic treatment, including inpatient facilities, community-based treatment models, and any other models or something along that line. 
because I think that that, that sounds good. And and you know, I, I think I think that that still allows, and I think we need to. I'm going to say, uh, Mary, I, I think we do need to call out the community-based models or any other models because that's important. It, some... Oh, a ab absolutely, and I yeah. completely agree with it. That's why I said it. They yeah. should all go beyond a level playing field, and whether you have to, yeah. in language, put it there, that's great, but it should be there where you're not highlighting just one technically over another. They should all be there. Okay. So, Bill, what you're saying, just so people are clear in terms of what the language could look like. Well, I'm, I'm, and this is my this is my best suggestion right, right. now, and right. I would want to step back and kind of say, am I missing something? But I think there, I think this is point well taken. Uh, that somehow the 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 I think it's implicit in the language. At least for us, it was implicit that you be people would be looking at whether there should be a forensic facility. Because later we're saying, should there be a forensic facility? But I think what make it explicit models for forensic treatment, including inpatient facilities, community-based treatment, or any other models. Right, so you would take out other than and put in including. I think so at this point that, you know, I think that's what I'm, because that doesn't take anything away. It doesn't say they're not going to look at community-based, but it looks at, it says they're gonna look at all the different models mm -hmm. because you need to do that in order to then come to the conclusion in the next report as to whether or not there should be a facility. Right, and that next report right. is five months later. Yeah. Right. So I, so in terms of process, um, <laughs> uh, I can suggest a possibility since I'm already taking something else back to our committee that we take some of your suggestions back and see about incorporating them, mm -hmm. so that we're so that we're providing judiciary with one amendment. Is that I mean, if we could. I think that would be oh, that would be a help. That would be very helpful. Is the I know Mary is comfortable with this language. Are other folks comfortable? I'm seeing nods. Okay, so if you could bring that suggestion back to your I committee, Bill. I will. That's great. Okay. And I think, and I thank think you. ironically, thank I think you, we'll Bill. have some time. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I think ironically, we have some time tomorrow morning unexpectedly that when we can kind of revisit this, my committee's going to say, "I thought we were done. I thought you told me we were done." We got time tomorrow morning too. Yeah, okay. And then an H, any additional recommends to address the gaps? So that's sort of a catch-all. That's a, that's a catch-all. Okay. And then number two is really this next preliminary report, which is based on number one that we just finished on whether or not a forensic treatment facility is needed in Vermont. And that would be July 1st. 2022. Mm -hmm. And then in January 1st of 2023, there'd be the final report would come to all of our committees that refines and finalizes the recommendations of those preliminary reports that are in one and two above which would include the size, scope, and fiscal impact of any forensic treatment facility if, if one is recommended in subsection two, which is that report in July. If they recommend a forensic unit or facility here in Vermont that for the beginning of the next biennium, January 1st, there would be a recommendation that would address the size, scope, and fiscal impact of any forensic facility if it's recommended back in July. And if it's not recommended, then that might be moot. Mm -hmm. Or it might morph into something else, into forensic treatment services or something along the lines as opposed to a facility. Right. So both options are out there for more study refinement. Um, so we have a better direction on where to go two years from now or a year and a half really from now. Are folks okay with that language in the process? Okay, I'm seeing nods. Mary, are you okay with that? I am. Okay. So C, this is another report 
and it's in February of 2022. And this deals with notifying the prosecutor when someone is on a non-hospitalization order and they have violated their conditions. This was language that was adopted on the floor of the Senate. And, and I might say this was initially put into the statutory change recommendations in the first part of the bills that came from the Senate and everybody in the Apparently, uh, we didn't. We did not take testimonies, but the House Judiciary Committee said they had consistent recommendations to take it out of the statute as a recommendation for now and put it into the study. Let them, because there's there's quite a bit of controversy around whether and how there should be notification regarding a violation of non orders of non hospitalization. Uh, as as an example, we heard Deputy Commissioner Fox saying, "Is someone missing one?" dose of medication, a violation, and should there be notification? It, not necessarily. That's not necessarily a, a substantive chain, a substantive violation, but it is a violation. If someone misses an appointment, should that be a violation? It, 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 there's, there's the department saying this, this is the language as proposed was overly prescriptive and uh, they, they were not in support of it at that time, but they said, okay, well, well, let's talk about it. And that's what this section basically says. So let's um, let's move to D one, mm -hmm. and this is also for the forensic working group to look at. So, okay, this is D1. So can I jump in here for a minute? Yeah. Uh, I think this is, these are some considerations to be taken to, to taken into consideration in the overall preparation of all of these reports and that they should uh, consider social and racial equity issues. Again, that was frankly in the Judiciary Committee report, we were a little embarrassed we hadn't included in ours, but we imported it to ours. Uh, because in fact, uh, again, useful to note that there is a disproportionate, there is a disparate, disparate number of uh, people of color in both our psychiatric facilities as well as our correctional system. And so therefore this is simply underscoring the fact that racial equity issues uh, and uh, need, need to be thought about in the course of uh, anything that we're doing here with uh, thinking about further forensic needs as well. And so our committee strongly supported that. So what this section is saying that on that report that's coming back on July 1st, that's the second preliminary report, that the working group should really look at if they decide to do a forensic treatment facility, they need to look at A and B within that facility, correct? Yes. Okay. So I'm clear on the dates. I wasn't clear on the dates before, so I'm clear on the dates now. So then the question was asked on B, consistency with General Assembly's policy of working toward a mental health system that does not require coercion or the use of involuntary meds. The question was asked, is there a General Assembly policy somewhere Yes, this is directly a quote out of statute. Yes, the, de the General Assembly has adopted, we have adopted as the General Assembly uh, uh, some principles, they're aspirational, uh, not saying that if we don't, if, if everything doesn't comply with this, that it can't be done. But the, one of the aspirational principles is that, the, that Vermont is wor work toward, and this is the quote, work toward a mental health system that does not require coercion or the use of involuntary medication. Uh, it occurs to me that I might include a citation there. In statute. A citation to the statutory reference so that people know where to go to find that. Because that was the question and I said, well, it's probably in statute. Yep, it is. So I, I'm, going to, I'm going to make a note here to add a citation for that. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing sometimes when you have other people look at it, what you can see? <laughs> It is, and it's, you know, it's, it's like you read it, you, you get, 
you get kind of, you read it and you read it and you read it and you think you got it. And then someone else looks at it with fresh eyes and you go, Oh, Oh, <laughs> right. No, that's, that's exactly, our own little bubble. <laughs> no, that's exactly, that's exactly right. And then these, these considerations will be reflected in the final report that is pursuant to B3. Okay, and that's the report that comes in January 1st, 2023. Yeah, and, and I, that's actually, that's what I was referring to earlier when I said these, these need to be incorporated into all of the final report. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what you're referencing there, yeah. yeah. And then E goes into your accessing your regional and national expertise. And again, that reference is also the $25,000. They said, we really need some financial support to do this. And that was the recommended. I don't know that I shared it with your committee, but we had an email from the Department of Mental Health saying, uh, our judgment is twenty dollars to $25,000 would be sufficient to, for us to be able to reach out to regional and national experts. The previous draft that we looked at of yours was draft 3.1 and the, it was X. Yeah, it was just a blank. It was a, we, were in, we were waiting in anticipation of a recommendation from Department of Mental Health. And I did share with the committee that was thought there would need to be an appropriation to support this working group. Great. So where are we as a committee on- I need to tell you one, one other, can I, oh, are you talking about the appropriation? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Sorry. No, I just want, is there anything else on section six? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One more thing. Uh, we discovered, again, uh, along the lines of what maybe it was Representative Martel said, we looked at this and looked at this and with Ledge Council, and then we finally, we looked at it today and went, that's not what should be there. In lines, uh, in G, mm -hmm. it says members of the working group are not state employees. Uh, wait a minute, maybe that is. That is right. I mean, you want, you want members... Wait a minute. No, 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 no. What's wrong here is that here, what's wrong here is there's some standard languages. This is not the right stand because there's oh. a lot of this working group who are not state employees, but they are they are employed like by the hospital right. association or well, by they the, get or, paid. Yeah, and there are it's so the, the language we, we need to just substitute in here this the boilerplate language that says uh, for those it essentially says for those who are not already doing this in their paid employment, and that then will refer likely to the victims victims representatives and those with lived experience mm -hmm. not pull in people who are not state employees like uh someone from the vermont medical society because so, we don't we're not playing we're not we're not going to pay those right per diems and you know, i think that's the intention right so that's going to be replaced with the regular language it's used right Okay, so for section six are we okay as a committee with what healthcare committee has proposed in this language. Are we okay with this? I'm seeing thumbs up, nods, yes. Yes, thumbs up, looks good. Mary? And I have, and I have three suggestions yeah. that I'm gonna take back to my committee that yes. you that came out of this discussion. Yes. Yep. Right, with, with, with the changes, yes. Yep. So right now we're good to go on this with those changes, Bill. Okay. okay. I see Linda with her thumb up, so that's good. So then there is this new section seven, <laughs> and I've kind of, I've briefed the committee on this a little bit. Okay. This is our justice oversight committee, though it says creation of committee. It's not creating a new committee. No, it's the already there. Yeah, and our, our committee members went, why, how many committees are we creating? I said, no, 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 this is something that already exists. Right. So your committee was okay with having one member at large on the house side as well as a member from healthcare committee and two members at large in the senate as long as the senate's fine i'm fine right? yeah right this may be a battle with the senate who knows so i just i think i, I want to just be clear i think it's actually critical that the house health care have a representative have a member on the justice oversight the joint justice oversight committee because issues of health and mental health regularly come up and they will come up increasingly so as we talk about forensic issues and about health care and mental health care. And it's, it's, it's been a noticeable 
absence uh, as I've had to attend and sit in the audience while the Joint Corrections Oversight or the Joint Justice Oversight Committee talks about issues which are actually the jurisdiction of our committee and we're not able to participate. So, however it gets achieved, that's all I care about. Right. And we do change sometimes the makeup of this committee because at one point the House Education Committee had a member yeah. on the Justice Oversight and now we've kind of gone away from, from that issue within DOC, we've taken care of it in some form. So then it keeps kind of melding for that. So Our committee was okay with the suggestion that Sarah brought to us and that you had previewed with me which is to say have two at large senators and one at large house member and one designated house health care committee member. Right. Because for, for the committee in the Senate, Senate health and welfare committee has both medical and mental health. Where our human services committee only has the health care. Oh, we have health care. I mean, you have health care. The they have substance health, abuse. Right, substance abuse and Someday we'll sort it all out. That issue and the mental health is with the health care committee and health care. Right. Kurt? I just was not sure what you said about the members at large. So now there's, instead of one from the House and the Senate, there's just one from the Senate. No. What we're proposing is if you're going to include a member of health care committee, you need to include a member from the health care committee on the House side not on the Senate side. So we also have a member at large that we need to keep, we wanna keep. So on the House side, we're increasing the membership from 10 to 12. So on the House, you would have a member from healthcare and you'd still have your one member at large. On the Senate side, because Senate Health and Welfare covers both health and me mental health. You don't need another member from there. So in order to have six members on the Senate side, you now have two members at large from the Senate instead of one. Whew, now I'm totally confused. How, how many members? 12. The committee shall be composed of 10 members. So first well, sentence. We're increasing it to 12. So why do we say composed of 10 members? That's the old committee. They should be the old language. It's the old language. It should be 12. Oh. Kurt, can I just say that we changed this? That was our recommendation initially, and we changed it in conversation today and oh. in response okay. to what your committee kind of telegraphed to us as a proposal. Okay, so what I have is not what we're really dealing with. Okay, that's fine. Thank that's, you. That's why there's a dis. Disconnection there. Disconnect. Disconnect, yeah. Our side has already been appointed. So instead of pulling something back, we just add. In the Senate, I don't know where they are at this point. No. So I'm seeing okays with this. Okay. So, Bill, I think we're good to go with some of those changes. Mm -hmm. Alice, the yep. only thing is, what, what are we going to put for the title creation of committee? Because oh. that really isn't creating a new committee. So what will be in that line? Well, that's current statute. But, uh, we, one. Can we, we were suggesting putting in, they have the informational, or what are they called? They're inside of three asterisks on each end. Right. They give you basically information so they would say, uh, either pull it right out of the statute where it says justice, Joint Justice Oversight Committee or give an informational piece that says it's for that committee. Yeah, right, because I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, otherwise it's confusing. It's uh, confusing. Right, well, it looks like we're adding the 100th commission or committee to be studying something. <laughs> that's true. That's right. true. Yeah, and that's not what's going on. Right. So we're, we're okay, what I'm picking up from committee members with going through the draft, making those recommended changes that you seem amendable to, Bill, that you're gonna then refer back to your committee. I think when you get your final draft, your final version <laughs> with these changes, um, 
and go through them to also let us know or see the draft and maybe we can just coordinate all of our votes tomorrow morning to be in support of it. Does that make sense to the committee members? Are we sure we need two new members on this Justice Oversight Committee? You wanna let go of Butch? I'm not, well, I don't know. I'm just, just like there's so many committees and so many people out there that, and why is it an even number? Why is it what? An even number. Because you're balancing the House and the Senate. Okay. That's why. It's not like a study committee where you want an odd number so you can't stalemate. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll stay out of this. Well, it's true. <laughs> it's true. No, this is to represent both bodies equally. Uh, Sarah? I, I just think that actually adding in the perspective of the health care and the mental health care um, into the so many of the discussions around justice reinvestment that we've been doing over the years will, will really be a great um, help and I think will help us as we um, work on legislation moving forward that will be informed by that perspective. So especially with regard to this, the forensic uh, uh, yeah, I'll just say, I, don't want, I was going to say forensic unit, but it's not necessarily a unit <laughs> that we're talking about. It's so, a piece, however. It's a piece, yeah. So I, I think it's a good addition um, uh, to, to expand that committee. So logistically, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. House Judiciary indicated that they will, or I've been sent the link that they will be meeting at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. It was sounding as though at that time they were looking for, and I don't know if it's the same in Representative Lippert's committee. I think they were looking to kind of have our um, overview or our recommendation from our committee at that time. Is it likely that will be after the fact, later in the morning possibly, or what? What do you think, Bill? Should we? Well, I, I can try, I can, like two, two of the, there's, uh, there are three suggestions that came out of this discussion. The first we had already agreed to in our committee, just as a matter of the language that was in terms of the out of state. And the last is adding a citation that's straightforward. The second one is the one just clarifying that we had discussions with Representative Morrissey and us about having all the models looked at. I think that I think that should not be a, a major issue. I want to make sure, to be honest, Mary, I want to make sure I step back and go, no, did I, did I suggest something that didn't make sense? But I think what you're suggesting and what I suggested is consistent with where we were really going. Uh, I, I will try to process this with our committee. Uh, via email this evening. And if, if I can get everybody on board, uh, then we'll have Katie do a, a clean draft so that we hopefully could present something. And I'll just basically, we did a straw vote and I'll just ask people to do a straw vote by, if I can try to accomplish this this evening, I will. Because I think that would then put us in line for providing that draft to your committee, uh, which you are, I hear you saying in a preliminary way, anyway, your committee is ready to support and if that's, and, and I'll check in with uh, Representative Grad, who's the chair of judiciary, and see right, if we can't line everything up. To, right, I was just going to suggest that so that they are anticipating responses from our committees when we are not quite there yet, but I'm sure we can get her done. Yeah, so and I, and I, I'll, I'll check in with Maxine to see whether, or how critical it is to have something at nine o'clock and Right. But I think maybe we can achieve it. Which means for our committee, we should probably <clears throat> think of coming together at quarter of nine to start and then just quickly take a vote. And I'm, I might need to do the same. If, if I can't get it done by email, I might just ask our committee to weigh in at, to, to convene at 8.30 or quarter of nine just to get that taken care of. Yeah. yeah. So Bill, you and I should be in contact this evening to see how far along you are. Yeah. Your committee, and then that will determine what we do here. Yeah. Okay. I think we're close. I think we're very, yeah. very, very close. close. Karen? Yes, just confirming with Representative Lippert, you mentioned the three things, and was there the fourth thing as well as figuring out the um, the who is going to designate the oh, folks with lived experience? Yes. 
Yep. Yes, I think you're right. Yeah, I'm just looking here. I do have a note. Four points. Yep, that's that's you're right. There are four things, and that is the that's the other one. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's hard sometimes to put all this, think about it on your feet. I'm just trying to keep track. It helps to have others thinking as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I think the committee is supportive at this point of this the draft with these changes. I just want to confirm this with folks. We're okay with this. And pending any major changes, I think it should be a pretty quick vote tomorrow on it. And Bill, I want to thank you and your committee for really doing the heavy lifting on this. As I've stated to the, this committee here, our committee, we're really coming up to speed in terms of the forensic world. Um, we deal with corrections and then the mental health piece, we really haven't grappled with too, too much within the world of corrections and with forensic in terms of what the process of the court process for incompetency to stand trial and the uh, sanity defense and how all that plays out. So we were coming up to speed on, on those processes and the issue of being competent to stand trial or insanity um, defense. So I really appreciate the work that your committee did on this because it would have been a heavy lift for us to to do this and i hope well, i just i'll just say i think i think increasingly uh, your committee as the committee of jurisdiction for corrections is going to be faced with dealing with more and more issues of health and mental health mm -hmm. and so i think we're going to need to actually work collaboratively uh, because i think frankly one of the issues has been that the issues of health and mental health services for indiv incarcerated individuals i'm going to adopt uh, is it al yeah his yeah. phrase uh, for incarcerated individuals has in some ways slipped under the radar mm -hmm. of anybody's jurisdiction. And that's, uh, I think that leaves Department of Corrections both being responsible and in some instances, there need to be other parties involved, I think, yes. at some level, at least in our jurisdictional committees, if not uh, otherwise. Yeah. This allows for an evaluation of that. Well, thank you for your help. Well, thank and, you. Uh, and I, I hope I speak for the committee in saying thank you for the work that your committee has done. It's been a terrific help for us. Okay, so I'll get on it and see if I can get those four things resolved. Okay. And then you and I can connect later on this evening when I know where you are, your committee is, Bill. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Good you. to visit. Yes. <laughs> Now you can go back upstairs. Yeah, I was just going to say, I still talk about it. Well, I was going, going to go down to the Institute, Corrections and Institutions Committee. But for some members, they've never even been in the building I as know. a legislator. So it's like, where are you going? <laughs> well, we get more exercise in the building because at least we're going up and down the stairs instead of just getting up in your chair here and walking out to the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Okay, folks, I think that was pretty good. We got, I think our committee put in some really good input, input and suggestions. So I feel pretty good about it. How do you folks feel? Okay. Really good changes. Yeah. Because it really doesn't lock us into the original language about a facility language, really good changes on all the way around. I wanted to make sure it was balanced. And I think Mary brought up a good point. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we've got kind of a light schedule this week for committee. We don't have anything scheduled for tomorrow morning on this. We will be meeting on this. And um, I'll, I will know more as the evening progresses with Bill doing the work with, his, with Katie, the drafts, his, the legal staff for the committee, as well as um, getting back to his committee. And once I hear something from Bill that um, things seem to be okay, hopefully, and we have new language, uh, I'll connect with Phil to get the language out and then set up a time. So I would be prepared to meet tomorrow morning around either 8.30 or a quarter of nine. Um, seeing that Mary has to be in judiciary at nine o'clock. Is that correct, Mary? That's what they said, but that was why I asked the question. 
are you and Bill going to talk with Chairman Grad uh, to say you're, you know, we're you're in, we're in the last stages of finalizing the proposal? And basically, the language came from the health care. I guess I would be, and I don't want to assume anything here, I guess I would be because they said something about me testifying. So basically, I think I would just be reporting that the committee agreed with the language and language ch changes as is presented in this phi, uh, would be, I guess, draft 6-1. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, that's technically all I would be saying, correct? I believe so for this particular, right? right. So, right. I, so I will check with Maxine. I think Bill also said he would check with Maxine in terms of trying to find more of the time frame if it's really at nine o'clock or it might be more a little later for that. Right, and that's all, and that's all I was saying so that we are on the same page and they're not waiting for something that is probably likely to come momentarily, but not maybe right at nine o'clock. Right, right, just to cover our basis. So I will do that. And then, so be on the lookout for an email from Phil in terms of what time we meet tomorrow morning. It could be 8.30, it could be quarter to nine. Hopefully, knock on wood, everything is okay with the language and we can just quickly take a vote on, on the draft. Okay, makes sense to the committee. And Alice, when did, yes. when did you say we were getting possibly the capital bill out of well, the Senate? The last I heard from Senator Benning, they're planning on voting it out tomorrow afternoon. So if they vote it out tomorrow afternoon, it goes to Senate approves. And it might be on the floor as early as Friday or next week on Tuesday or Wednesday. Depends, you know, the Senate operates on a little different schedule than the House in terms of when they bring things up or how soon it gets kicked out of Senate approves. So we probably as a committee, we would see the Capitol bill as a version as it voted out of Senate Institutions Committee. We would see that Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening or Thursday morning, whatever that time frame is. Um, and then it could change in Senate approves. It could change on the floor of the Senate. So we would physically not get the bill back until next week. That's the thinking at this point. So late tomorrow, maybe Thursday morning, we'd, we'd see a version of the uh, Capitol bill in the spreadsheet, see where they made the changes. Y yeah, I know, but they're not voting it out, Phil. <laughs> that was a conversation I had with Senator Benny or email. He said he was hoping to get it out tomorrow. That was his plan being Wednesday. They put it on their agenda to have people pay attention. So that was my understanding from Senator Benning. To pay attention to the two changes they made while mm -hmm. I've been thinking the ship. I think they're making a few more. I think they're okay, I'm just I'm just being a tad sarcastic. <laughs> pardon me. Pardon, pardon me. I think they're hitting something in Springfield. I wonder why. <laughs> Bargaining chip. Um, and I think they're also in conversation <clears throat> with the administration about the 113 million for uh, the ARPA funds. And they need to be in conversation with, with Senate Appropriations Committee as well. So there's some moving pieces over there that they have to work through. Alice? Yeah? Um, I, I was, I've been following the Senate's agenda too, just to see where they were, that were um, what they were up to. And I noticed that um, 
that they, they had folks from the administration coming in to talk to them about ARPA. Would we do the same thing over here on our, our, our side, I hope? Right. We will, when, we will. We gotta see where the Senate institutions ends up, what the administration is proposing for that. We don't know where, we don't know what's gonna happen over there with ARPA at this point. So we'll have a better idea when the bill comes out. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's gonna happen. No idea for that. Some of those conversations are even beyond our committee too for that. So. So we're in a wait and see, we're in a holding pattern on the Capitol bill at this point. Things uh, just, you know, things change. It's part of the process. Just like we changed some Senate bills, um, they changed some House bills. Yeah. So we'll see. And then when we see those changes, and this is one thing, Sarah, we talked about that earlier when we convened, when you were upstairs, it's like, what, what's the process for when the Senate version comes back? Yeah, and you concur, can concur with further proposal of amendment, and that's negotiations that you do with the, our counterparts and Senate institutions to modify some of the changes and see if they agree to. If they don't agree, then you set up a conference committee. It's so funny. Healthcare had the same conversation <laughs> about about the process. So, and and your explanation matches up with. Um, Representative Lippert, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's advantages to not going to a conference committee. There's some disadvantages. There's advantages to going to a conference committee and there's some disadvantages. So it cuts many ways for us. But we will be setting up time to have Senator Benning come in and um, walk us through the changes and if they vote the bill out tomorrow afternoon. Um, that's something, Phil, that maybe we can schedule with Senator Benning on Thursday morning. Okay. Um, would be a thought, because I know he's in Senate Judiciary in the morning. I, we're gonna be tied up on the floor really long on Thursday afternoon, so I'm hesitant to do that on Thursday afternoon, unless, unless we come back at 12 o'clock or something, if we don't have much going on Thursday morning, we could work through, uh, come back at 1130 maybe and work through till one o'clock or something. There's a lot of changes. So that might be in play for Thursday. So we'll wait and see. Any questions, any thoughts? So we're done our work today. So let's finish up on YouTube and then we'll see everyone back on YouTube tomorrow morning.